everybody. I'm Katrine from Sussex Underwater. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you so much for inviting us, Sally. It's been an absolute pleasure and a brilliant day so far. Thank you. So we've had some incredible talks today about the kelp and the science behind it, um, how important it is in the race to get it back to our Sussex shores. But I'd now like to talk to you more about the human story and how amazing this amazing restoration project is inspiring people to, have, um, to, to want to help our seas. So, Sussex Underwater is run by local people for local people. We are a group who are passionate about the sea of Sussex and bringing it back to its former glory. The group was set up by a few local divers. They, cam they campaigned for the trawler ban, having witnessed firsthand the destruction of the seabeds over many years. As local divers, they felt that what they'd witnessed had gone on for so many years unchallenged because it was so many people, for so many people, the sea was out of sight and out of mind. So the Sussex Underwater Facebook page and group was set up to show people what was happening under the water and to hopefully document the return of the kelp to our shores. We now have over 3,500 people in the group and some of our posts reached over 100,000 people. This includes fishermen, anglers, divers, local environmental campaigners, schools and churches, to name a few. Everyone is welcome to join in the conversation. Our aim is to capture the Sussex Bay's return to glory over the next few years. We plan to do this by filming Sussex Underwater and encouraging others to do the same. As a group, we have grown, and as a group has grown, so has the awareness of the urgent need to protect our seas. <coughs> The film we're about to show has footage that divers in Sussex have filmed since March this year. The kelp you will see is from Bognor Reef. It is one of the last remaining kelp beds in Sussex, as it was protected from the trawlers by the reef. This film reflects the growing passion, enthusiasm, and understanding the people of Sussex have about the kelp and its importance. I'd like to thank everyone in our group who got involved with it. So here are the voices of the people of Sussex and what the Kelp Restoration Project means to them. I'm David Phillips and I'm part of the Sussex Underwater team. Um, I've been diving and free diving the Sussex coast for over 40 years now um, and it all started for me offshore and beach. Uh, I can remember huge areas of kelp and abundance of marine life um, but sadly it's all but gone. Um, I hope the trawler ban will help kickstart the regrowth of the whole marine ecosystem and bring back those kelp beds and all the life that went with it. Um, I do think we've got exciting times ahead um, and I can't wait to see the positive effects this is going to have on it um, over the coming years. As someone who loves being by the beach and is currently studying zoology at Sussex University, Restoring kelp in Sussex is really important to me as it will increase biodiversity by supporting many marine species. The sea will be full of life. I'm very fortunate to be in a position where I can experience firsthand the beauty of the life just on our shores. And I want to protect that so my kids and future generations can experience that too. But even more than that, I totally understand the overwhelming importance that kelp has to play in our fight against negative climate change. Its protection and restoration is absolutely crucial. And we're really delighted about the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project here at the church. In fact, we are so delighted. Uh, we recently created an art installation in the church 
to celebrate uh, this conservation project. So we're really looking forward to seeing a lot more marine life out there in our, our sea. Uh, our church is situated right on the beach. So the sea kelp also has a, another benefit in that it protects our church from storm surges so that we can stay here for another 100 years or more serving the people of Shoreham Beach. Uh, I've been a lifeguard at uh, Brighton Home City Council for nine years and I love to swim on my lunch hours and I speak to a lot of bathers but one thing we really miss is that we very rarely see any wildlife in, in, in the sea at all. We get very excited when we do see anything. So with the potential for the kelp to uh, spread and oxygenate the water, I hope we see a lot more wildlife and uh, come on to kelp, spread right down to the Brighton Hove as soon as possible, please. Hi, Eric Smith, the old codger of the Sultan's Underwater team. Just like to thank everybody for the um, tremendous effort over the last 30 years to get the Chores banned and the destruction stopped of our ecosystem in Sussex. All I really want to see is for the sea to come back to what it was in my youth and for my grandson to enjoy the delights I enjoyed. We are so excited about the trawler ban, knowing that the kelp is already showing signs of recovery, capturing carbon and looking after the biodiversity in the sea, which is just right here for us, is really, really cool. It means that we get more sea life, more fish, more sharks, more seals, more whatever you want under the water. <laughs> but more than that, it shows our young people that we are capable of doing the right thing and protecting their future. We're not becoming dinosaurs! <laughs> the last year, uh, with lockdown, we've seen much more wildlife here. We've seen, um, we've seen, and also with the trawling ban, we've seen dolphins for the first time. I've, I've never expected to see dolphins and I was in utter amazement when I saw them and I've seen them four times this year which has been fantastic. We've seen seals. The kelp beds here are growing um, and it is fantastic and what what we've seen is the, the start of something great here. I mean if we can get the kelp beds um, back from Selsey down to Shoreham again and get the ecosystem firing on all cylinders in the way, it's, the way it was designed to, that would be great and I think it's the tides are turning. Uh, I think we've gone from abusing the sea here to big nurturing it and getting it back up to its full potential. Sea kelp is really important because it helps lots and lots of sea creatures and they eat it and live in it. Save sea kelp! I've been diving with my club, Brighton Sub Aqua Club, from Shoreham for the last 20 years and I've seen massive changes underwater off our coast. Um, I've been surveying the kelp um, with Sussex Wildlife Trust and Sea Search since 2019 and I'm really, really looking forward to the kelp coming back. One of the best dives I had this year was off Selseyville on the Pular Banks where the kelp was growing really, really well and it creates a wonderful understory for all sorts of other wildlife, uh, bryzoans, hydroids, sponges, and also we saw lots of juvenile fish there. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to everybody that took part in the nearshore trawling bylaw. It's brilliant now the sea's got a chance to be able to rest and hopefully the kelp can come back. Together as a team, and individuals across our Sussex waters. We need to work together to understand how we can improve our waters from here on, creating a pathway for future generations. And we need to prove that now we've got this bylaw in place, 
we can now up our game and change our waters for good. I, I wait with excitement and anticipation uh, for the future. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what we're going to see over the next few years. Sustainability, Digital and Resources at Aidan Worthing Councils, and it's great to be invited. Thanks very much, Kelly, and, and everybody, uh, to talk about our interest and our support and involvement in, in this work. I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between nature, place, and community, because I think what we're seeing here in so many of these incredible stories, Sussex Underwater, just now, is ha- how people have deep relationships with nature and how many more people could have that opportunity as we as we see these habitats restored. Um, Aidan Mining Councils are two coastal authorities next door to Brighton um, and of course we enjoy the coastline of, of roughly, um, I think it's about 30% of the trawler exclusion zone that, 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 that um, we've heard about. Today we serve a population of 170,000 people and um, we're really interested to explore in this age of nature what, what role local authorities should play in helping us as a wider community really lean into this challenge. Um, uh, the folk at the coastal office there on Worthing Seafront have done a great job um, uh, commissioning a local artist to uh, celebrate the return of the Kelp Forest, which is a beautiful new feature on the seafront. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about about this generational ambition that we that, that, that we're involved in here, and maybe think about an even broader ambition for nature along the, the Sussex coast. These are my three boys uh, enjoying the sea. I think this is in Devon, but I'm really thinking about the long-term nature of the work that we're doing. Uh, the, the, the world that I live in day to day is very short-term politics. It's making decisions for the next election and this kind of thing. But what we all need to be doing is thinking about the very long term uh, for the next generations. I've been reading an amazing book, probably lots of you have seen this, but if you haven't, then please do have a go at this, The Good Ancestor, which talks very much about really behaving in a way and making decisions in a way which is for um, the seventh generation down, I think a lot of native communities think about doing things now so that generations ahead will, will benefit. Um, and you may have seen, um, some of you, this, this diagram. This is called the Donut Economic Model. And basically, the red zones are the bits which are going wrong. On the outside, it's the ecological and climate crisis. And we're in the red zone in many places, as we know. On the inside is something about social justice, which is inequality. And uh, the, the, the sense of needing this long-term work to be about a just transition, which talks about and supports communities as they change, as well as tackling the climate crisis. And I think this is, in a sense, the the nature of the work that we're all doing. Um, Ada Council have very much leaned into uh, the challenge of not so much blah, 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 but do, do, do. Um, And we've bought some land on the Ada River with an aim to create, essentially, sort of demonstrate a project of how you can restore nature. Um, The council invested about £1.3 million in in that land to protect it from housing development, to protect the floodplain. Um, Pad Farm is the the circle at the top, and New Salt Farm at the bottom, and we're working with lots of partners in this room to make those restoration projects a reality, including um, the farmers group, the Alan Tueda Farmers Group, um, who we're working with, because the valley up to uh, Stelling has potential for wide-scale restoration. Um, we've been thinking a lot with partners about, well, if, if we're doing this work, the, the Kelp Restoration Project is doing this incredible work, if we're doing this work on the Ada River, and there are many other restoration projects in Sussex, what does this mean for how we work together as, as a community, learning all of these same 
techniques, these methods, this community engagement? What does this mean for the wider geography? Um, you've mentioned, we've, we've heard mention of this Sussex Bay, the natural geography, and we're at the very beginning of, a, of some thinking around what that could be. Um, in terms of community engagement, as, as councils, we've, uh, over the last year or so, really thought about how do we engage with people in a different way. So these, these sort of fussy old committee meetings don't really cut it when it comes to speaking with people uh, about the issues. So last year we did a climate assembly, which is uh, a particular method of getting people together on a topic. Um, and it involves getting a representative group of people. In this case, we had some people who were really skeptical about climate change, for example, bringing them into a room, getting lots of people to contribute their expertise so that the group could learn together about the issues. We had Jonathan Porritt, for example, speaking to the group. Um, and it was an amazing experience of people really getting into a subject, having challenging conversations, and ending up with a set of recommendations that the councils are very much using as, as, as a guide, including helping with the kelp forest restoration. So that's, that's the sort of thing we want to keep on doing. Um, as you heard earlier from Morgan at Blue Marine, uh, we've been starting to build relationships with our local fishing community, and we're working on some projects there. I see Paul and Mike are in the, in the, in the audience um, to really think about how we can um, respond to nature as it restores. You heard about the fish stocks increasing. How can the council play a role in helping the fishing communities build back um, and take advantage of, of, of uh, the produce of the sea? Um, and I think part of part of what we're interested in as a coastal local authority is how can we how can we think about the ecotourism opportunities that this rebuilding nature gives to us? How can we help communities really engage with with the coastline, with the sea? There's, there's evidence that about 25% of kids who live in Adrian Worthing haven't actually seen the sea, believe it or not. And there is something very powerful about how we can help people engage better uh, uh, through these sorts of activities and how these new businesses may emerge as, as, as these habitats that get restored. Um, finally, we're really interested in um, how we can unlock sustainable long-term investment in, in these habitat restoration projects. And we're doing lots of work with DEFRA and with local colleagues about how to achieve that. And um, that's me, I think. Hi everyone, um, as I say, lovely to be here and lovely to see so much amazing work being done by so many amazing people as well. So um, I'm just going to introduce myself and then Sarah's going to introduce herself um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of people, the general public in citizen science and data collection as well. So so I'm Kate, I'm Kate Whitton, so I work for the Marine Conservation Society um, and I'm a very long-winded title, I'm the Volunteer and Community Engagement Manager for the South East. So essentially anything volunteer, anything community engagement wise, that's me. Um, and what kind of falls under that umbrella is a huge number of sort of citizen science projects. So um, I won't dwell too much on the Beach Watch programme because again that doesn't really include kelp. Um, but then again, particularly for climate change, climate mitigation, we're involved with the seagrass project. Um, and again, something I'm going to be talking about in, a, in just a little while is the Big Sea Research Project as well. So again, it's all about empowering people to get involved uh, and to help contribute towards science projects as well. So, so that's me. I'll pop on, on to Sarah. Hi everyone. Yeah, so my name is Sarah Ward and I'm Living Seas Officer at Sussex Wildlife Trust. Um, so many of you probably know me in loads of different contexts because my role is really very broad. Um, I cover everything from sort of marine policy um, all the way to citizen science, just like Kate's been talking about. So um, in regards to the presentation today, I'm going to specifically be talking about the citizen science that we coordinate and how that all ties into um, the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. Um, so, what actually is this science? We've heard a lot this morning about research that's been going on in all the various research institutions that are part of the, um, the restoration project. And um, so, citizen science is public participation and collaboration in that scientific research. So, sometimes it may be entirely led by a community, and other times it may be that um, a, it's managed 
by an organisation or a research facility that draws on uh, the enthusiasm of the public to get involved, um, making it very, you know, a coordinated manner of collecting data. And sometimes participants um, may be just able to attend because it's something they're really interested in, and other times it may be that they can attend certain training, upskill themselves, um, or specific data collection events. So why do we use citizen science? Why would we want to use citizen science? So um, it basically enables investigations that wouldn't otherwise be possible um, by harnessing people's, as Sarah just said, people's interests, the power of people's motivations as well, and um, the concerns for the natural environment. So there's a huge number of people out there who don't necessarily have a scientific background but really want to help. So again, it's all about getting that, that people buy-in, for example. So you know, when we're not at work, we are people, same as everybody else. So, you know, what are our interests? interests? Why would we want to help? So, again, that goes beyond, uh, obviously, the sort of the educational or the sort of scientific background. Um, and the benefits, obviously, of people getting involved in citizen science go far beyond, uh, you know, the actual research activities, for example, for both the organiser and also the participant as well. Um, so, for us as organisers of citizen science, we can engage lots of local people, lots of communities on the topics at hand. Um, it allows us to teach and to spread the word as well, hopefully to sort of empower lots of other people. And obviously as a participant as well, it basically means that you can get a lot of benefit out of it, whether that's from simple enjoyment, um, you can meet new friends, you can upskill. Um, and of course, we talk a lot these days about sort of mental well-being as well. You know, we really need to sort of get back to our roots uh, and make sure that we are really sort of get involved with this on the ground as well because, you know, this is our planet. So, you know, if we don't do something about it, it's, it's really not going to sort of get better on its own, really. So, I'll pass back to Sarah. Um, so, citizen science in the context of kelp, that's why we're all here. Um, I'd like we've just been saying, you know, there's citizen science projects can, you know, come from all different manner of, of different reasons. But in terms of um, kelp and what we're actually doing here today, um, the projects that Kate and I work on, um, a lot of them are pre-existing projects that um, have already been running and we can, um, we're going to quickly summarise how they actually fit into the context of, of today's summit and the kelp restoration project. Um, we can use these projects quite beneficially without having to make any fundamental changes um, to how they're actually run in order to collect data which can be used by all of the different research organisations involved in the kelp restoration. And, and then additionally, we've been able to harness the, the really clear enthusiasm which has been abundantly clear today um, to actually create a bespoke recording scheme um, which I'll talk a little bit more about further on in the presentation. Um, allowing us to actually have a, a specific recording scheme just for the kelp, just for this particular project. So, in the context of recording seaweed, recording kelp, um, there is the big seaweed search. So, this is jointly run by the Natural History Museum and by the Marine Conservation Society as well. Um, so, this particular project was set up in 2009. Um, it was specifically to sort of find out what was happening to our species of seaweed uh, along the coastline. Um, as we've heard in the previous presentations, about 650 different species uh, of seaweed along the UK coastline. We didn't want to sort of scare people with that many seaweed, you know. Um, so we chose about 14 key species, um, of which are affected by uh, climate change, by sort of ocean, ocean acidification. Um, that affected by sea temperature rise, and also the introduction of, of non-native invasive species. How fast are they spreading as well? So the big thing research uh, is designed to be done by anybody. Um, there is a standalone leaflet, of which some of you might have seen out in the foyer there, um, and you literally can pick that up, read all about it, and then actually go out and have a look and see if you can find these 14 key species. So there's a lovely little guide on there. Um, it tells us how to identify things. We've done some great videos as well, popped on the Big Sea Research website. Um, and in addition to that as well, you can actually join um, some Big Sea Research training sessions. We run these informal sessions. It sort of basically just gives you a little bit of a leg up. It's always nice to go out with other people to find out exactly what they know. If there's more eyes on the ground as well, you can get some, as I say, a little bit more experience under your belt as well um, in knowing what to record and how to record it. Um, so it's nice and simple. It generally takes about an hour to do the survey. Um, and literally, you're recording presence and absence, but also the types of seaweed that you see 
uh, on the floor as well, again, in context of these different 14 species. So, just on to the next slide. Um, and we've had loads of different people get involved as well. So, people who might have got a little bit of background knowledge, which is always great, obviously. But again, if you come to a training session, you can learn more about how to identify these species. Lots of resources online as well. Um, and these, um, all these data uh, at points really, really super useful because they go into a big sea research database. Um, we've, been, we've had over a thousand records so far, but obviously we, we always need more. You know, things are changing really rapidly as well. Um, we've had local school groups get involved, um, and they are really, 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 they have a really great time as well. So, as I say, it's all about harnessing that, that people power as well um, and contributing to good science. So there is, um, actually on the website itself, there's a feedback um, and also a data survey summary that you can find out exactly what's been going on, what we've found on the beaches and, and on the shoreline and what's actually happening, how things are changing over time as well. So I'll just pass back on to Sarah so we can talk a little bit more about what's happening with the Civic Wildlife Trust. Okay, so um, like I said, we've got a, a few different projects that we run. I'm just going to sort of give you a real whistle-stop tour of, of what we do through those projects. Um, so the first project is um, Shore Search. It's a program of intertidal surveys. It happens at set locations along the Sussex coast. You can see on this map here, um, I think that's actually our map from 2019, but we generally try and visit mostly the same sites year in, year out, so that we can keep an eye on any changes that are happening at those particular sites. A lot of them are focused around um, the marine conservation zones, so we've been looking at a lot of those sites uh, for quite a number of years and obviously collaborate um, with organisations like the Sussex Isca, Natural England, um, to make sure that that data is available to them. Um, it's also been undertaken by volunteers, um, but there's always at least one survey leader there. The participants don't require any specific training, but we're really, really lucky to have some really dedicated volunteers, a number of which are in the audience today, um, who, some of whom have a background in a relevant field, and some of them have just committed a lot of their time and effort to really learning about marine ecology, and of course all of that is really, really helpful when we've just got eyes on the ground looking for, for all the different things that we find on the shoreline. And we have different survey techniques that we use, and that's really important because it allows us to strike a really nice balance between collecting useful data, but also um, ensuring that volunteers remain interested, because I think if we make it too sort of coordinated and uh, intensive, it, it can go a little bit boring. So we, we like to really harness that joy of just going out and rock pooling and turning over rocks and seeing what you find. Um, our protocols have been developed collaboratively um, between the Wildlife Trust nationally um, and also with Natural England nationally as well to ensure that that data that we're collecting um, really is as useful as it can be and it, it does get used in um, things like the um, management of marine conservation zones and the advice packages that Natural England um, supplies for those. Um, so on to sea search. Um, sea search uses volunteer recreational divers and also um, snorkelers and even swimmers to undertake really quite simple ecological surveys underwater. And so, unlike shore search, sea search volunteers do have to undergo some training, um, and that can be progressed to take on different specialities as well. Um, so, sea search data collection is twofold. We can actually organise um, our own targeted survey, so um, I'm the coordinator for Sussex, and so essentially part of my job is deciding where we're going to survey, where we want that data, and of course, with the kelp project, um, it's been really exciting for us to, to sort of utilise sea search to go towards those really important sites. Um, a lot of which a lot of the other researchers have mentioned, so Bognor Rocks has always been an important site to sea search and shore search as well. So, Anya and Steve, you're going to be taking us out to Bognor Rocks for many years to come, I'm afraid. Um, so, um, Yes, we've got the, our own surveys that we organise, but then any qualified volunteer who's been through um, the sea search training can actually undertake a sea search dive on any dive that they do within the UK and Ireland um, under their own duress, and that obviously helps us just really massively increase the geographical area of which we can collect that data. Um, so as I mentioned, the sea search spans the waters of the whole of the UK and Ireland and is actually coordinated nationally by the Marine Conservation Society. Um, but Sussex Wildlife Trust is really fortunate to, to have the position of, of local coordinator. And it's probably one of my favourite parts of my job, actually. I really, really love research. 
Um, it's an award-winning citizen science project. As you can see here, we've had um, awards for the, for the project itself um, and also awards for individual participants. Um, some of you may recognise Bryony there, who used to work for Kent Wildlife Trust, um, who's always been a massive, massive part of, of research. Um, it's been recognised for its contribution to, to open source data, which is really important when it comes to citizen, citizen science. Um, and then finally, just um, talking about the, the scheme that we have actually created specifically for the CALP project. So, like I said, there was a really clear um, drive from people wanting to get involved and wanting to help. And um, if you are one of those people that wants to get involved and wants to, to do something towards the project, then this is, this is the perfect opportunity. Um, so, we created a, a flexible form which basically allows anybody to be able to input data. And that means um, they can actually input data on where they've seen kelp, but also where they haven't seen kelp, which is equally as important in terms of us mapping the extent of the kelp and how it's changing over um, the course of the next few years. Um, it's a form which is accessible to anybody. You don't need to be a scuba diver or somebody that's always out in the water. And um, we've created it so that it can be used by anybody from avid scuba divers all the way up to occasional beach walkers. Um, so, like I said, it takes data on where kelp is as well as where it isn't. Um, and it also um, takes records for if you've just seen it on the beach. So, obviously, you're not probably very likely to see a live kelp if you're just walking along the beach. But if you've seen it washed up, the likelihood is it's probably not come from that far away because um, seaweed degrades relatively quickly. So, if it's washed up on the beach and it's still recognisable as kelp, that data is still useful for us. Um, it also allows us to find out a little bit about the environmental factors and um, where you saw the kelp or indeed didn't see it, um, so that we can better understand that physical environment, um, how it's changed and where we might expect to see kelp that we haven't seen it, or where you haven't seen kelp but the environment is, is not really suitable for kelp anyway. Um, and that helps us really just understand the whole picture and the context of what's going on. And what we're then doing is, is using this um, data collection scheme and amalgamating it with other data sources. So from all of the people that you've heard from this morning, any other data sources that we can get our hands on basically, um, and create a really comprehensive map of kelp in the Sussex Seas and how that's changing. So if you've not already registered, please do. Um, I've got an iPad with me today um, with the form preloaded onto it, so you've got no excuse, and I will be loitering around later, and you can just literally pop your details straight into that, and then what we'll do is um, get you on the system and send you a really nice um, little package that explains exactly how to do everything, not that it's difficult. Um, so yeah, please do come and talk to me if you're interested in getting involved in that. So where does all the data go? Um, so there in terms of the true research, um, we have the database, and it all goes into it all goes into that. It gets used more scientifically. Um, essentially, oops, get my notes. Um, so we've got a generalised flow diagram here of what happens to the data from collection to the storage, and then obviously what we use it for. So the first step is to um, is for our data sources and our supplies. So that's obviously our volunteers collecting the data for us put it directly into the citizen science program. So they might simply direct, simply enter their own data, for example, um, or we present it to the organiser to input. Um, again, it, we always uh, ask people if they can sign up to the website, make sure that they can create, create their own login so they can keep a track of their own data as well, which is really useful. Um, depending on how the program runs, of course. And then generally there'll be a stage or multiple stages of quality assurance processes. So this will range from things like checking the identification of something, and some particularly a, a supplied image or various supplied images, um, to ensure something like the GPS location of, of a dive, for example, even in the nearby car park, for example, so something as, as simple as that. Um, then the data will go into a, a, a suitable database, at which point it might get amended, it might get transformed or amalgamated with other data as well, uh, and then it will get archived. And it will be allowed to, and then lots of people will be able to access that as well. So we have an open source uh, data policy for the key research too, um, which will probably be the same for, for Kelp as well. Um, and then of course we'll use that for analysis and publication and figure out exactly uh, what else we can use that for as well. 
Um, okay, so that's basically all we have to say. Um, here are some links if you do want to follow any of that up. Um, but like we mentioned earlier, we'll both be around um, later on if anybody wants to discuss anything. Um, finally, um, we could probably talk about citizen science and the benefits of it until the cows come home. But um, what we wanted to do is actually let the volunteers speak for themselves. Um, so we've got just a short film um, of some of our volunteers that participated on one of our um, sea search dives earlier this year. So um, thank you very much to those um, involved in the film and enjoy. Yeah, so that was fantastic. It was like, I, wa I don't want to say surprisingly good, but it was surprisingly good. The, the visibility was excellent. Um, we could see for at least five meters. Uh, it was good to get in the water again after I haven't dived all through lockdown and since this wee fella was born. Um, but the other interesting thing was we, we, there was a lot of kelp actually, which is what we were looking for. Great dive today. Um, we just descended onto the reef and the first thing we saw was loads of kelp. Um, there was Laminaria digitaria and Laminaria saccharina. Great dive. Uh, we found, a, well, the first thing we landed onto was some kelp, which is perfectly excellent. So there's three types of kelp we encountered. Continued on, good rocky substrata. And there's quite a few, what I call, younger, m immature kelp there down there as well. So they're growing up and a very pleasant dive. Lovely visibility, most unusual for the Solent. We, we took some water samples as well, which we're going to have analysed for the, their eDNA to see kind of what, what else is in that area, um, and, and what the kind of proportions of, of different species and, and genuses are. And then my buddy Ryan had to take some water samples for DNA analysis, and um, I laughed so much my mask flooded because he was trying to collect water in a plastic bag underwater. <laughs> but yeah, just fantastic to be in the water again. Really great as well to be diving for sea search. I, I think it's a really important cause, you know, and a great citizen science project. Um, and uh, yeah, just fabulous to be able to get, get in the water and help, help out again, you know. The first thing I saw underwater today was my mojo. I've had a pretty miserable COVID time isolating. I've had two dives that weren't too special earlier this year and I was debating whether I was fit, young enough, fit enough, able to dive. But today was a brilliant day and I proved that I am. I think also what really turned it on for me was the seeing all the underwater sea life and I've done the sea search surveyor course and so you know, I did know what a lot of the things were and being able to see them, the visibility was good, the light was fairly good and it was a nice slow dive and we could see all sorts, so it was just awesome. My name's Nikki and I'm the Wild Coast Sussex Project Manager uh, and this is our amazing Wild Coast Sussex team and you'll be hearing from all of them in just a moment uh, all about our project and what we are doing to champion kelp. It's been absolutely amazing to hear all of the wonderful things that are going on um, and we really hope that our project can help sort of spread that kelp message further. So our Wild Coast Sussex project is led by Sussex Wildlife Trust in partnership with Marine Conservation Society, Sussex IFCA and Brighton Sea Life. And it's all made possible um, with funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And we're working really closely uh, with the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. No, I'll go back. So we're working with uh, young adults, school children, um, families, fishermen and volunteers all along the Sussex coast to build a connection to the coast to discover the wonderful marine life that we have here um, and hopefully empower these communities to take action to protect it as well. So one of the ways that we are doing this is working with local commercial fishermen um, along with recreational divers and other sea users uh, to report fishing gear which has been lost at sea. So this is otherwise known as ghost gear. And ghost gear is one of the most harmful forms of plastic pollution. Um, as you can see here, it continues to fish and that can then attract larger predators which can get entangled and it also keeps breaking down into microplastics. 
Um, so we're working with just existing and volunteer divers from a charity called Ghost Fishing UK to remove this ghost gear from the marine environment. Um, so you can see here in one of the photos in that top one there, um, there was some nets that was reported um, on the dolphin structure just off Worthing. Um, and this was removed and we can now see in the bottom photo, um, thanks to Eric uh, for sharing this with us, um, the kelp growing on this same structure, which is great. Um, it's sort of also removed nets found within the Kingmere uh, Marine Conservation Zone. Um, some of these were found to be wrapped around kelp. Um, and they've also removed over 50 pots just in the last year. Um, and if these are left in the sea, they could potentially uh, damage the seabed. And, um, you know, so hopefully by removing these, we're leaving a healthier habitat for kelp to grow. And now I will pass them to Ella. Thanks, Nikki. So yeah, hi, I'm Ella, and I run the primary school engagement part of the project. And one of the main um, aspects of that is running the Wild Beach programme. Um, and in case you don't know, Wild Beach is essentially taking forest school to the coast. So it's an education um, programme based on child-led learning um, and sort of uh, managed risk-taking for the children. And it's a chance for them to really develop a strong connection to their um, local coastline and to develop a love for it, which would hopefully lead them to wanting to protect it themselves and hopefully, you know, creating the next generation of marine conservationists and marine biologists. It's a really effective way to let children explore and learn about the marine environment for themselves. Um, we do loads of different activities, including rock pooling and beach cleans, um, shelter beach building, beach art and games, and um, to support the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, we're doing specific activities with them to let them learn about the kelp. Because obviously, we're taking them to the beach, but you still can't really see the kelp growing underwater, so it's a, a way to con connect them to what's going on under the waves and the brilliant conservation projects that are happening locally. Um, also, as part of the project, I'm running interpretation projects with schools. Um, I hope you've now all seen the, pro uh, the poster designs in the foyer um, and uh, that have been given to us by two different schools. So please, if you haven't already, do go and vote on them after the talk. The winners are going to be you as part of the project to help promote the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project in local areas, hopefully at Shoreham Port and some other um, locations as well. Just want to mention as well, um, our partner Sea Life Brighton are also running um, workshops for primary schools as part of the project at the aquarium based on local species and conservation issues. And they're also going to be having some Wild Coast Sussex displays around their tank which, in, which contain a local species such as the rays. Thank you. Hello, afternoon. I'm Alice and I'm based at Marine Conservation Society. And uh, I also sit on the Sussex Kelp Restoration Partnership Steering Group. Uh, so at Marine Conservation Society, we don't yet engage that well with uh, young adults, particularly kind of 16 to 25 year olds. And so as part of the Wild Coast Sussex project, we are focusing on kind of trying new things to see if we can do better in this regard. Over the summer of 2019, we conducted interviews from Selby to Hastings to ask young people what they wanted to do more of. And, you know, we, we really wanted to find out how we could meet young people where they are to talk to them more about their local sea, including help. They told us that they wanted events specifically for them. They wanted events when the weather was good, that were free, that were chilled out, safe, a mixture of uh, quiet and loud. Um, they wanted food, they wanted it to be adventurous and fun and creative. Some wildlife elements led by young people, focused on mental health and well-being and being closer to nature and celebratory. Next slide, please. So as a result of our youth consultations, um, we developed a kind of a series of events, kind of nesting them in the kind of either quieter, smaller, or louder, larger kind of style. So perhaps some of our smaller events include things like guided heritage walks, art classes by the sea, and guided mindfulness walks. And our louder and larger events, things like uh, skating by the sea events, silent disco beach cleans, and water sports poster days, all fully funded. We will use these events um, to engage better with young people who perhaps 
um, could really benefit from additional time spent by the sea, and we will use this time to talk to them about what is going on, including the Sussex if Commerce or Trawling Bylaw and the Cut Restoration Project. We're also engaging them in citizen science projects such as the Shark Trust Egg Case Hunt to hopefully support kind of Elagma Bank recording across the Suffolk coast and support with information that way, as well as generally engaging them in the NCS Beach Watch program. Um, you know, we're really keen to meet more young groups, you know, groups that support young people who perhaps would really benefit from our funding. So if you are connected to any of these, uh, any groups like this, please come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Sophia, and I support Wild Coast Sussex as a project assistant. As has just been said, we've been working on developing fun, safe, and inclusive events for young people in Sussex. I am developing one of these events, which will be a beach clean and close walk for young LGBTQ people, and which will be held in Brighton. I want to provide a safe space for young queer people to explore their identity and set into fashion sustainably while enabling them to discover the Sussex coast, learn new things, meet new people, and discuss environmental issues. So with this, I hope that we will be able to create connections with local businesses, reinforce our partnerships with local organizations, build relationships and trust with young people in Sussex, and bring down barriers to enable people from different communities to access and enjoy the sea. Thank you. Hi, I'm the other Sophia of the project, and um, there are two of us. Um, I do all the implementation and communications through that, which is no mean feat. Um, we're really working on growing a digital presence and working on, on digitally connecting people with the ocean as well, especially as we've talked so much about hitting that hard to reach group of 16 to 25, and the best way to reach a lot of them is on social media. So we're working really hard, especially on Instagram, to get them onto our events and get them out and about, and also educate them and connect them with our amazing Sussex Coastline and in particular with the Kelp along the Sussex Coastline as well. Um, and yeah, generally raising the profile. Um, we're hoping to use our digital communications to inspire behaviour change um, across the board, so across every age group, but, um, in particular with that age group. And we're also making a real effort to make everything we do as accessible as possible. So that's simply using things like our pronouns and everything that we do, everything we uh, promote online, uh, making sure there's like full accessibility descriptions for everything, so type of everything, etc. Um, hoping that you know that will make us as accessible to a wide group of people as possible. So just to sort of finally sum up everything, thank you so much for listening to us. If you want to go over to Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we are at Wild Coast Sussex and give us a follow. We've got a brand new social website coming in about a month's time, so keep an eye out for that. But right now you can find us on the Rain Conservation website and it's Wild Life Trust website. Um, and if you want to email us, there is our email at the top of the screen. Thank you so much.